something very different. Yes, of, of course. And, uh, Their truth is representational. Right. So yeah. can you elaborate maybe on this? See, that's also, that's also partly why the Catholic Church historically has been so put off by the rational intellect. You know, like people like Dawkins say, well, you know, yeah, they went after Galileo because he was undermining their superstitions. It's like, yeah, partly right. The other part was Seth, like the figure of evil throughout history, is always the hyper-rational intellect. And the reason for that is the intellect is God's highest angel, so that's Lucifer, and it falls in love with its own creations. It likes to make totalities out of its own creation. Once there's a totality, there's no room for the transcendent. There's no God. That's Satan's error, by the way. And everything immediately turns into hell. Now, you see, that was all put together particularly well by Milton. And Milton was a visionary. And what Milton felt and put together was the imagistic substrate out of which the totalitarian states were going to grow. He envisioned it. Now, it was visionary, right? He saw it as a battle between heavenly agents. But he codified it and he said, well, you know, here's, here's the approaching problem. Here's the approaching problem. The totalitarian intellect. It's like, and that's exactly right. If you if you talk to people who are suffering existentially, they're always in love with the products of their intellect. They do not pay attention. They say, Well, I can't see how my life has any meaning. And the answer to that is you're not seeing, you're thinking. And you can easily think yourself into a corner where your life has no meaning. It's a cheap trick. I can say, who cares about this documentary? No one, it's not going to matter in a billion years, right? Or in a hundred years or whatever. I can pick a time frame within which this event is irrelevant. Okay, so then you can derive from that fact that it's irrelevant. Or you can derive from that fact that that's a stupid way to think. So, and you can, you can derive the conclusion that it's a stupid way to think if you haven't made thinking your God. So, and there's lots of other things that work better than thinking. Paying attention is better than thinking. It's much better than thinking. Paying attention allows you to listen to people who don't agree with you. Paying attention allows you to learn things that you don't already know. So, you know, if it's thinking or attention that should be the God, it's like attention rules. Thinking, that's a subordinate phenomenon, but it likes to pop up on top, you know, because it likes its little tight theories and it likes to be right. Well, you know, forget that. You're not going to be right. You could say that the, the image of Christ is the West's attempt to most accurately represent the, the path of being that constitutes success across an infinite set of dominance hierarchies. That's, that's essentially, or that's, that's at least one way of looking at it. Now, there are figures, hero figures, you know, because Christ is like a hero, but he's sort of a meta-hero, right? He's the amalgam of many, 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 many heroes. But the hero is, has key attributes, like the hero, for example, is always encountering chaos and defeating it. Well, that's the human path, you know. We encounter chaos. It's often a snake. Well, that also points to its deep evolutionary roots. So. There's an anthropologist, Lynn Isbell, who wrote a book a while back called The Tree, the Serpent, and Vision. I think I've got that right. And she was interested in why human beings can see so well, because we can see really well. The only things that can see better than us are birds of prey. And she thought, well, why would a primate like us have such good vision? So she went around the world. She thought, she knew also that we were particularly good at detecting the kind of camouflage patterns that characterize snakes, especially in the lower half of our visual field. And she was kind of curious about that. And then she thought, well, you know, maybe we were preyed upon by snakes and, you know, maybe we had to develop good vision because we were preyed upon by snakes, like, you know, 60 million years ago, way back when we weren't even people, which is about how old snakes are. It's like 60 million years, something like that. So then she went around the world and she correlated the acuity of primate vision with the prevalence of predatory snakes. It's like, nice correlation. So she thought, oh, human beings and snakes co-evolved. Well, so what gives you vision? Snakes. That's what it says in Genesis. What else gives you vision? Fruit. That's also right. That's why we have color vision. Right. What makes you self-conscious if you're a man? Women. Right. That's Eve. 
So, you know, the, the stories in the Bible, the pre-flood stories, they're really old. We have no idea how old they are. And like, they're extremely old. And you might say, well, in story form, well, like actual story form, God only knows how old they are. But in terms of behavioral pattern, they could easily be 60 million years old. It's like the thing that defeats the snake gets the women. And you imagine that in tree dwelling primates say, well, up come the snakes. It's like the first guy who figured out how to drop a stick on a snake, he was very popular. So, you know, and so the snake, what's happened is that religion, so what, what's happened as far as I can tell is that the, the systems that our brain evolved to detect basically rapacious predators. It's not just snakes, but it'd be like reptiles with teeth, predators in the dark, things under the water, like, like crocodiles. That's like, that's the lurking anomaly, right? It's the thing you have to contend with. And it's actually a monster. You know, people say monsters aren't real. It's like, it depends on your time frame. If you add up and average all the predatory monsters across 60 million years, you get a monster, okay? The, the, so the, the, the amalgam of monster is a representation of the class of predatory stimuli. That might be a way of looking at it. Okay, so we're very sensitive to that because we were prey animals. Okay, then our cortex leaped up a level of abstraction. So then that same system started to detect anomaly as such. It wasn't just the predatory thing that was outside the dominance hierarchy, it was the abstract thing that was outside the system of ideas. It's the same thing. And so that became symbolized by the, the chaos monster. And we can easily throw that on our enemies. It's like, well, who are you? You're outside the hierarchy. Oh, you're a chaos monster. Well, yes, you are. It's, it, that's not an arbitrary prejudice. It's like, you are absolutely a chaos monster. And then the question is, what do you do with chaos monsters? One answer is kill them. The other answer is get their gold. That's a better answer. Because there's information in chaos. And we're information scavengers. And that's our niche. It's like, outside what we know, there's information. You might die retrieving it. But if you don't die, you're like a major hero. It's like, yeah, that's right. So is this the sense in which these um, religious or mythological stories and images are true? Yeah. Is it in the sense that they instruct action in a, in a way that, in the Darwinian sense, is true? Uh, right, and that's the only truth. sense in which truth exists. Well, if you're a Darwinian. Right. Right, so that's the problem with modern scientists. It's like, are you Newtonian? Or are you Darwinian? It's like Newton, he's wrong, by the way. Right, we already know that because Newton's only a subset of Einstein, let's say. And God only knows what the whole quantum thing is going to end up being. We don't even know how to structure our thought in accordance with those presuppositions. But Darwin trumps Newton. That's my hypothesis. So, you know, you might say those who... Ha so then the question is, what attitude towards religion is truly scientific? Right. I think my attitude towards religion is precisely scientific. So, because it's predicated on Darwinian, really on Darwinian presuppositions. Dawkins is a rationalist. He's not a Darwinian. He just thinks he's a Darwinian. Okay, can we, can we, can we explore this a little bit in terms, of, in terms of describing how you're working with these definitions? In terms, when you say that your approach to religion is a Darwinian one, and Dawkins is unwittingly, perhaps. He's an Enlightenment guy. Right. So the Enlightenment is like, it's really thin paint on a mile deep piece of rock. 